Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson, and we have a very fascinating guest today. You know, uh, you probably woke up this morning when your cell phone pinged you, and then you had to look at it immediately to see what you're supposed to be doing that day. (laughs) And your whole life seems to be revolving around that thing. Think about the last time you misplaced your phone and the panic that set forth in your life (laughs) and in our children's lives. Well, our guest today has something to say about that, but uh, he's also been uh, very active in getting churches started. And uh, can you just, uh, Pastor, tell us a little bit about how that became something that was important to you? Yes. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Carson, for having me on. Um, 92% of Americans have a smartphone. And uh, the latest research now is that uh, the general population are spending five to seven hours a day at screen time. And teenagers, on average, is seven to nine hours a day. Wow. And the impact, as you know, is a mental health crisis. Um, Social scientists call this a collective action problem. This is when uh, lots of people are doing something that is having a detrimental impact on them, but no one wants to step away individually because they have the fear of missing out. Uh, these phones, as you said, have, have become sort of the, the, the portal in the way that we experience life. Uh, everything is revolving around these things. And so um, we tried a little experiment with our church in and invited them to, uh, to go on a digital fast together. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and, and so um, what's interesting is that no one really wants to do a digital fast by themselves. But when a whole community does it together, when teenagers and parents and the teenagers' friends and uh, a small group at a church, the entire church, when they go on this journey together, you're almost gamifying the thing. Uh, one thing that's interesting, when I ask people, if they've ever done a digital detox or a digital fast, almost everyone says the same thing. They say, no, but I need to. People, people know that they have a, uh, an unhealthy attachment to these devices. And so uh, positioning, stepping back from them together as an entire community has turned out to be a very fruitful and a really exciting thing for people to do. Now, is it... Uh as much of a problem in Australia where you were born as it is in this country? Yeah, this is a global problem, um, which is, which is interesting because as uh, research has been done in the impact on, on, particularly on teenagers, mental health, particularly teenage girls, mental health, it is in all of the Western countries, it is exactly the same curve. Um, There is this same pattern of, of tremendous, uh, rise in depression uh, and suicide, feelings of sadness. Um, for a long time, the research was unclear what, what the correlation was between this technology and people's mental health. Mm-hmm. But the, the research is now clear. Um, it, is, it is not just a correlation, it is a causation. And so, uh, yeah, Australia is experiencing the same epidemic that America is with the impact of these devices. Yeah, you might be interested to know I actually lived in Australia for a year. You did? Where did you live? <laughs> in Perth. In Perth. I was the senior registrar at uh, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in neurosurgery. It turned out to be a tremendous experience for me. So, Well, that's great. And uh, you didn't pick up on the accent, Dr. Carson. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a dinky diocese yet, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like uh, my oldest son was born there. He is. <laughs> oh, no kidding. I had no idea. Yeah, he has dual citizenship. But, um, you know, one thing that I sometimes worry about when we look at the advances in digital technology, not just AI, but virtual reality, you know, it's hard enough to get the kids away from the Nintendos and Playstations. Can you imagine what it would be like when you can create your own world and disappear into it? What what does that say for parents? What do parents need to be thinking about? 
So I, this is what I like to say to parents is I, I want to give parents, um, I want to, I don't want them to feel guilty or ashamed of what they've done because the research wasn't clear until more recently. So a lot of parents, I have three teenage daughters mm -hmm. and a lot of parents did what I did. You have three when, teenage daughters at the same time in the same house? Yes. Oh yes. my gosh. Pray for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but what, what I did is when my oldest daughter was old enough to do sleepovers or play school sports or whatever, it felt like it'd be a good idea that we could keep in contact with her. So I found an old iPhone in a junk drawer in my house and I powered it up and, and, and gave it to her, you know, um, without a lot of forethought. Well, well, now the research is showing the impact of social media, particularly on teenage girls, particularly on girls that are going through puberty, uh, is, is very, very significant. It's actually very dangerous. And so the, 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 the best thinking advice now, um, a lot of it's coming from a, a, a social scientist by the name of uh, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he wrote a book called The Anxious Generation. And he is suggesting that people need to adopt new norms, new best practices when it comes to when we would be giving these devices to our children. And his best suggestion is there should be no smartphones before high school. If you want your child to have a phone, give them a flip phone, give them a phone that just does texting and, 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 and phone calls. Um, the second thing is no social media before 16. Um, let a child get through the majority of the, the, the puberty years before we start giving them the, the pressure of comparison and, and the impact of, of social media. You know, uh, full grown adults have a difficult time regulating their behavior and their consumption of, of social media. Uh, let alone giving it to a 13 year old and, and letting them just, you know, look at whatever they want. And in addition to that, there's so much predatorial behavior that is going on through the platform of social media as well. Uh, he's also suggesting that there should be no phones in schools and that, that kids should have eight hours of having a break from staring at their smartphones in, in, in the, the, the cafeteria, the lunchroom should be a place where they're developing social skills, where they're, developing social intelligence where they're learning to interact with one another rather than being by themselves in a corner doom scrolling on Instagram, you know? Well, you probably heard that uh, in the state of Florida, the governor recently signed a bill barring children from having social media yes. uh, accounts. And, yes. You know, obviously people are coming at that. Some are praising it. Some are saying, this is horrible. You can't do that to the kids. Right. Um, is this something that we should be legislating, you think? Or is it, is it something that parents should take on as their responsibility? I, I think we should legislate it. I, I really do. I, I think that parents need to have best practices. Once again, this is still a relatively new, this platform, this technology is relatively new. It is, it is difficult to have enough time to look at the impact on society. And so I think that the laws are catching up right now with, with, with all of this. But I, I definitely think it should be, it should be uh, law. It should be governed by the law. I, but I also think that parents need specific guidance on this. Um, social media right now is, is it, you've got to be 13. And yet there's no way of, um, of validating that at all, verifying that at all. Some kid who's nine years old can say, yeah, I'm 13. And, and, and sign up for an Instagram account. Um, and I, I think that these companies actually need to be held accountable for this um, because what has happened with social media is it's, it, this is a free service where the people have become the product themselves. Uh, the, and the social media companies are uh, uh, profiting uh, in an extraordinary way off of the exploitation of people. And the technology that is used on social media is the same concept as, as what is used in slot machines at, at casinos. It's, it's actually called variable ratio schedule. Right. And the refresh rate on, a, uh, on, on social media has the same uh, impact on, on people's you know, dopamine hits 
mm-hmm. as uh, it is when you're when you're pulling the lever on a on a slot machine. And and, and if you ever if you ever seen the face of someone who's sitting at a in a casino on a slot machine for hours, I've it's seen the them. same. Yes, it's the same face that someone has yeah. when they're doom scrolling on their on their devices. I've walked through uh, some of those areas in Las Vegas late at night. And they almost look like zombies. <laughs> like zombies. That's just, right. And uh, it really is very sad. And for people to understand that that's what's happening to a developing brain, because, you know, the, the brain is not fully developed until your mid to late 20s. And you have people who are having all kinds of negative influences. Your brain never forgets anything, by the way. Everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, it mm. stays there at a subconscious level in many cases, but it affects who you are and how you think about things. Mm. And that's one of the real dangers, I think, of, of TikTok. What, what, what's your opinion of that, TikTok? I think TikTok is the most addictive app I have ever seen. Uh, it's like crack for children. And um, the, the research has found that Instagram is the, is the worst impact on teenage girls. But TikTok is the most addictive. And, uh, you know, I mean, people burn hours staring at absolute nonsense. And, and to your point, all of these images, all of these short videos, all of, these, all of this consumption of this mind-numbing content is just getting loaded into their brains. Uh, is there any wonder that attention span is decreasing and, People feel mentally cloudy and they feel anxious and they feel overwhelmed. We were never meant to consume this amount of, of, of visual candy. Yeah. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the name of your book is Digital Fast. Is the Digital that... Fast. That's correct. Yes. I, I'm curious, uh, how long does the fast generally last? And after the fast is over, what's the lasting impact? Yeah. So the digital fast is a 40 day journey and the book is leading people on a 40 day journey and it is four movements of 10 days. So the first movement is detach. And we expect that when people start stepping back from their devices in the same way that they've been consuming, like any sort of unhealthy habit or addiction, you have some form of withdrawal. And there's a guide for sort of helping people detach from their device. That's the first 10 days. The second 10 days is to discover. And you start to discover all the things that you weren't noticing before because you were numbing out on your glowing rectangle, you know? So you discover things about yourself. You discover things about other people, you know, as a, as a pastor, I want people to discover things about their spiritual life and their faith as well. It is very difficult to hear from God when your head is buried in this, this uh, smartphone, this device constantly. So the, the third movement is delight because what happens is after you really get detached uh, and, and uh, you, you actually realize this is a better way to live um, without having your head buried in this phone all the time, you, you actually experience, it's like resetting your senses. And then the last movement is to determine and determine is when I get through these 40 days, what am I going to do on the other side of this? Now, the way that we define what a digital fast is, is not necessarily taking a hammer and smashing your smartphone. It is thinking about the apps on your phone through the grid of either distraction or utility. Not all apps are the same thing. Um, Instagram is not the same as your calculator app on your phone. No one's grabbing the calculator app and scrolling for hours. No one's playing with their Southwest app for hours, you know? So what we want you to do is to turn your phone back into a utility device instead of a distraction device. So you want to remove things like social media. You want to remove the news apps. You want to remove video apps. You, you want to remove games. You, you want to remove anything that is going to be a wormhole of distraction mm. and then turn it back into just a utility device. And so what invariably happens, particularly when you're starting out on a digital fast, is you grab your phone, you unlock it, 
And then you realize there's nothing cool to look at on there anymore. And, and instead of you then, you know, being sucked into a wormhole of distraction, you put it down again and you interact with people that you're actually with. What a crazy idea, right? <laughs> and, and, and after, and after that digital fast, what's the recidivism rate? Well, so what we do is I, I encourage people to, uh, Marie Kondo, their digital life. Marie Kondo is famous for helping people clean out closets. And, 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 and she has this idea where you take an item of clothing and you need to ask yourself, does this spark joy in me or not? Hmm. And if it doesn't, then you throw it out. So that my challenge to people is when you get through this digital fast, consider does putting Facebook back on your phone spark joy? And what a lot of people have done, a lot of people have done, Dr. Carson, is not put social media back on their phone. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't ever interact on social media, but they don't have the same frequency and access because this device is with them all the time. And so it, it starts to help people have more of a healthier engagement with these platforms. If you're only going on social media on your laptop, That means that you're not doing it when you pull up at the lights and you're waiting for 30 seconds, you know? Right. And, and so it's, it's taking some of these platforms, reimagining your relationship with them and putting them back into a healthy place rather than them being all consuming. So a lot of people have done this long term. I, and I did that myself after I did the digital fast, I decided I'm not putting social media back on my phone and, uh, and my life is better because it's not on there. (laughs) Well, you're so right on target because, you know, particularly the news apps, you know, every five minutes, you know, they come up with a headline, which really is not true, but it sucks you in. And then you get through with that. And then there's a whole list of other ones down there. And the next thing you know, you've wasted an hour <laughs> looking at those things. That's right. That's right. And, 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 that's so, and it doesn't mean that you don't ever want to watch the news or you don't want to be informed. It's just that the fact that these devices are almost like an appendage of our body now. And when you have just a constant draw to, to, to be distracted, um, it is ultimately having a detrimental impact because we have a difficult time regulating our consumption because of the frequency that we have with these devices. This, uh, this book, The Digital Fast, has uh, become something that's benefiting people from around the world. How did you go from a pastor to someone who is really uh, affecting entire populations? What, what gave you the idea to actually put this into a book form? So uh, every year in my church, we do a 21-day fast. Uh, we start the year by having a time of prayer and fasting. Um, the spiritual discipline of fasting may be the most neglected biblical practice in the modern world. Um, and people don't like to do it. I mean, it's uncomfortable. I, I don't like to be hungry, you know? And yet, um, it may be more relevant than it's ever been because we have an ability to appease every one of our appetites at any point now. And so a lot of people were saying, you know, while we were doing the, the, the fast, the season of prayer and fasting, a lot of people were saying, well, I need to get off social media as well. And I thought, that's a really good idea, but it's a different idea. And so I decided to say to the church, hey, later in the year, we're going to try something that I've never tried before. And I've never even heard of a church trying this before. But what if we did a digital fast together? What if we all stepped back from these devices together? So the first time we did it was last year. We've now done it twice. Uh, The first time we did it was last year. And I was amazed Mm. at the impact. Uh, and, and people, people were so thankful that they got to do it. It was an opportunity for parents to talk to their kids about their digital consumption. It was a chance for parents to talk about their own. Um, it was just very, very high impact. And so what happened is after we did this, a bunch of pastors from around the country started asking me how we did it, what were the, the rules or the guidelines of doing it, and could we help give them guidelines on how to do it in their church? And so that was the, the reason that I decided to write this book. I wanted to create a resource that would guide people 
through a digital fast. Mm. And uh, I, I think that more and more churches are going to be doing this because it's such an ideal experiment in uh, a, a, a church community. But I also think more pe- there's, a, there's a collective uh, consciousness that has come across our society now where people are awakening to the idea that the smartphone might be taking from them more than it is giving to them. And yeah. it didn't used to be like that. No, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Just the, the digital world in general, because uh, when I was practicing, a lot of times parents would come in and they would say, uh, the pediatrician says, we need to start the kid on Ritalin or some other uh, medication. And I said to them, could you hold off for three months? And during that time, wean your kid off of all of these devices. Wow. And substitute time with you, reading, Mm -hmm. discussing things, just some family interaction time. And in three months, if they still need it, let me know. Yeah. In almost all cases, they didn't need it anymore after that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that Isn't that was, fascinating? It's fascinating. So, yeah. uh, but you found a lot of anxiety, depression, and other types of emotional situations associated with this. Uh, as a pastor, uh, you know, you deal with uh, emotional distress all the time. Um, why do these devices produce that, in your opinion? Well, I, I think that particularly social media, uh, it, it causes comparison. Uh, people project a life that is not actually true. You know, you you compare the highlight reel of someone else's life with the reality of your life mm-hmm. and what you know about your life, you know. And uh, our lives are filled with lots of mundane moments and a lot of things that we have to do. We've got to pay bills and we've got to clean and we've got, you know, these are these are these don't make great digital content, you know. All right. But when you're escaping into your device, um, what happens is you see the highlight reel of someone else's life, and you basically have this sense. We call it FOMO, right? It's it's the fear of missing out. Uh, it used to be prior to these devices, if if uh, a bunch of friends got together and didn't invite you, you didn't know about it. And ignorance is bliss, isn't it? <laughs> you don't worry about things you don't know about. Except now you're watching everyone else uh, go to these certain gatherings or parties or events or whatever, and you realize, I didn't get invited to this. And you you, you can feel a sense of rejection in in all of that. I think that there's a collection of reasons that are producing anxiety. And I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are on this as well. But when when people feel a, um, a sense of discomfort or anxiety or shame, What is happening now is they're reaching for their devices and they are distracting themselves from that feeling. None of us want to feel anything that is unpleasant. And so now we numb ourselves by looking at content. And all of these feelings keep getting suppressed inside of us and and undealt with. And we we basically are, are, are numbing ourselves through life. And so when someone says, how are you doing? You're kind of like, I have no idea. (laughs) <laughs> I'm I'm staring at this thing all the time. And I think we have a hard time regulating our consumption because there is lots of interesting things to distract you, as you were talking about with the news apps. There's always, you know, it's limitless. There's always something else, you know. And so uh, I think that the comparison, I think that the, the over uh, consumption of these devices and I think the way that we are numbing ourselves with these devices uh, are all contributing to the rise in in anxiety. I think that's exactly right. And I, and I think a lot of the people who put out all of this material actually have ulterior motives in, in terms of manipulating people. You look at what's going on in our societies today, people driving wedges on the basis of race, age, income, religion, political affiliation, gender, you name it dividing people up into very identity groups. Yes. And and uh, that is extremely detrimental because one of the things that creates a strong society is a sense of community. Yes. A sense of this is my neighbor. 
and I don't care what their religion is or their politics are. It's my neighbor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what does the Bible say? Love your neighbor. Not That's hate right. your neighbor, not cancel right. your neighbor if they have a different yard sign. And uh, yes. since that's so prevalent, it's pushed, you know, even by, you know, the president of the United States, those people, you know, and yes. we're always them versus us, as opposed to us working together towards solutions. Yes. I, I think that probably creates a lot of problems. But so many of the teenage girls, and you've got three of them, uh, seem to be severely impacted yeah. you know, by this to a greater degree than almost anyone else. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think that when, particularly when girls are going through puberty, um, they are, you know, they have a surge of, of, of hormones, their bodies are changing, and they're looking for external validation as they are starting to differentiate from their parents. And so when their minds are filled with, you know, so much of social media, it's, it's just so superficial. You've just got uh, uh, people uh, in provocative poses and, uh, you know, pornography and you, you just got so much of this content. I mean, there's a rise right now on, on, on preteens uh, buying skincare products. Have you seen yeah, this? I've seen that. And it's, it's just insane. I mean, I mean, their, 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 their skin is perfect. You know, they're, they're, they're 11 year old girls, you know, and they're doing all these skincare routines. And this is just the, the superficiality that is imposed upon them as they engage on these platforms. And I think that they are comparing themselves with other people. And, and a lot of the time, these people aren't even real or the no. photographs have been completely doctored. Exactly. They're comparing the flaws that they have in that they perceive about themselves in their physical appearance with what looks to be physical perfection. And they, they feel bad about themselves. And um, it is, it is very, very detrimental to their mental health. What can parents do and at what age should they start to help their children understand their own self-worth? Well, what parents can do, I think is not give them a smartphone while they're in puberty, while they're going through the pubescent years. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, like, like I, I said earlier, don't have smartphones before high school, which is, you know, 14, 15 years old and don't have social media before the age of 16. Like that could be a best practice that people would be adopting, giving guidance and all of that kind of stuff. But by all means, as a, as a pastor, I would be encouraging parents, to be to be sowing into their children their value, uh, their their God given value, and their identity as a as a child of God, yes. um, getting them off of these devices and helping them develop a a very healthy uh, self worth and self esteem, uh, help them with 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 social intelligence and the way that they are interacting with one with, with one another. Um, we are seeing a generation of kids who are so socially malnourished that they don't know how to have a conversation with an adult. Right. And uh, I think parents need to work very intentionally at trying to develop those skills in their children. Earlier on, did you say that uh, for a lot of the teenagers, their screen time is as much as nine hours? Seven to nine hours is the average for a teenager in America now. Wow. I mean, that's, that that's a full-time job. It's a full-time <laughs> job. That's right. That's unbelievable. That's right. But, they're, but they're sleeping less. Uh, it's, it's impacting their sleep. And also, because so many of them are allowed to use their phones at school, uh, they're able to log a bunch of hours uh, during school time as well. Well, there, there is one good thing for older people who have senior moments. You can always look it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, and, and that's the thing with these devices is that they they are also very useful. They're also very helpful. Um, my challenge to people is let's make them utility devices, not distraction devices. You've been on uh, a lot of interviews with this. You're with Pete Hexed and Shannon Bream and a number of people, but in general. 
Uh, how is your message being received? You know, uh, it's it's so interesting. It it used to be that the strongest felt need as a pastor, we would talk about this sometimes. What's the strongest felt need in society right now that we can be speaking to it? And I think it used to be busyness. Hmm. People would say, you know, like I'm just too busy, and you talk about that, and they're like, man, I need to slow down. I need peace. I think the strongest felt need of busyness has been replaced with with uh, digital media addiction. Mm. I think everyone universally feels that this is a, a significant problem and it's a more urgent problem because of the impact, particularly to children mm. and their brain development, their social development, and of course their mental health. So people are honestly, they're looking for a way forward. They're looking like this just feels so overwhelming. Like what, what can we do about this? These devices are integrated into every part of our lives. What can we do? And, and so to, to do a digital fast is an actionable step that someone can take to step back and then also then evaluate what do I want my long-term relationship with these devices to look like after I've taken a break. It's a, it's a reboot of sorts. It's a detox that then allows people to do more permanent habits coming out of it. People have loved talking about this. Hmm, interesting. Now, taking a, a little different tact here, in terms of our society in general and its downward course, what role can the church play? and helping to stem that? Because I've noticed that there are a lot of churches today that are woke. Mm -hmm. You know, they have their finger up in the air seeing which way the wind is blowing right? and uh, moving in that direction. What do you think about that trend? And, well, and is the Bible still relevant today? Well, I believe the Bible is tremendously relevant. Uh, I recently taught through the Sermon on the Mount to our church. We spent five months teaching verse by verse through the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, written 2,000 years ago, has never been more relevant. I mean, it speaks with profound specificity hmm. into the moment we are in. And uh, particularly in this season of, of great polarization. You know, I think that social media has become the new coliseum it is forcing people to fight with one another and the ones that are really profiting off of this are the social media companies themselves All right so so for christians to be leading the way in in offering uh, a, a a call to humility uh, a call to unity a call to uh, uh, being charitable to one another, even if we think differently. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity for the church to be modeling what it looks like, to be unified in a time that is so divided. And um, I, for one, am trying to lead my church that way in, uh, in just helping people be kind to one another, help people uh, have the fruit of the spirit, help people be loving to one another. Um, we are all being impacted by the media and by social media and it stirs us up to anger and polarization we're actually the ones that are being manipulated to do this and it is not the best way to live the best way to live is the jesus way the best way to live is to is to forgive people and be kind to people and serve one another and 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 be humble and christians by the way studies fine are happier than than the general population it turns out that the jesus way really works it does. and i want to invite many as many people into that as i possibly can well i frequently when i'm giving talks ask the audience to take the niceness pledge which just means for one week you have to be nice to everybody you encounter including your spouse and yes. uh, <laughs> people actually enjoy it when i go down the list of what that means <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine because we've become so self-centered I say just uh, you go out to get your car and the parking lot is full and you see three people following you because they want to get your spot when you get in their car I said 
don't open the glove box and pull out. Just get out of the space and let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, but so often, you know, we do think of, about ourselves and what's good for us and not what's good for others. And uh, sometimes people can use that against us. Uh, the Marxist, uh, for instance, uh, use jealousy and envy as a great tool uh, to gain a following. Of course, they never follow through on their promises to the people, and mm -hmm. people don't seem to, to realize that. And one of the things that is so prevalent in Marxist ideology is get rid of God, mm -hmm. because uh, they want you to be dependent upon them, dependent upon government, and not upon the things that are important to us as a society. Yeah. What uh, What is your feeling about Marxist regimes that claim to want to make things better for everybody? What is What are they really? Who are they really making things better for? Well, when you when you remove God from the equation, you really remove the 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 morality and the scaffolding that allows our society to function. Mm -hmm. And when you believe that you are a child of God, you are a child of the creator, you are made in the image of God, it, it produces a, an inherent worth and the, 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 the moral scaffolding that, that allows us to live by a, a series of principles that are beyond ourselves. They are right. beyond just our own selfish uh, desires to, to, to win or to put ourselves first. And uh, the call of Jesus is, is a call to surrender, uh, control, a, 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 a desire to serve other people and to serve God. And That's so um, I am... I, 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 I see tremendous harm in, in, in the, the Marxist ideology that is, that is seeking to remove God from the equation. Well, you know, it was uh, Vladimir Lenin who said, give me your children to teach for four years and the seed that I sow will never be uprooted. Right. Uh, they understand the same thing that Christians understand by reading Proverbs 22, 6, that said, train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Right. And it's so important, I think, for us as a society, and particularly for parents, to understand how critical their role is, uh, particularly in this day and age of, of digital ubiquity everywhere. That's right. Uh, That's right. You know, uh, Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes to steal kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and life to the full. I'm not sure I have ever seen a device or a piece of technology that has more of a proclivity to steal, kill and destroy. It steals our time. It kills our relationships and it destroys our peace. Absolutely. And the, the enemy is running rampant through these, uh, these pieces of technology. Well, you've done us a great service by this ideal of the fast because most people and particularly a lot of young people don't think that they can actually live without these devices right. Right. Uh, that control their lives and you might have seen the uh, clipping of the person who threatened one of the senators uh, last week yes. you know, if you do this if you take away my social media, my phone I will find you and I will kill you, and I will cut you into pieces. I mean, give me a break. It shows it's nuts. The, the profound effect that this stuff has on people. It and is. It's I like a drug. Think, I don't think a lot of people actually understand the concept of addiction and how serious it is. You know, there's a, a disease called Berger's disease where the small capillaries uh, become occluded and people can actually lose fingers and toes and even larger portions. And it's caused by smoking. Wow. And you see it happening and they know it's happening. I've seen pictures of people who have Burgers disease who are holding the cigarette with the stumps because they've lost all their fingers. 
And I suspect, and they're still doing it. Yeah, and they're still doing it. Uh, same thing with drug addicts. But I suspect a lot of those people, if they could push a button, and they yeah. wouldn't be addicted anymore, they would wear yeah. that button out. But the yeah. same thing applies to digital addictions. Mm -hmm. But we, there is a button you can push. You can turn it off. You can prove to yourself that you can live without it. And I think that's what you're showing us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes people think that, you know, being a minister or being a missionary is about standing out on the street corner uh, and thumping a Bible. But it's also about practical living yeah. uh, in a world where you can actually be happy and fulfilled. Uh, yes. if you don't let other people dictate to you what you're supposed to be doing. That's right. And my hope is that people will take 40 days to turn down digital distraction and turn up devotion, turn up the voice of God. You, you have such an ability to be able to hear from God when you get rid of all of this clutter out of your life. And uh, the book is, is has 40 days of devotions in it as well, so that you're not you're not just putting something down, you are also picking something up. And, and you're, it's a, it's a guide, it's a spiritual guide where you take these 40 days to say, God, would you speak to me during this period of time? And, um, and a lot of people have got a lot of value from that. Well, I think uh, it's valuable for any kind of addiction that you have. Uh, I advise people to get this. Where can people get the book? So you can get the book at Amazon. You can go to uh, the digitalfast.com. There's a bunch of resources on there and um, you can download a free chapter uh, if you'd like to do that as well. Fantastic. Well, we want to thank you so much for writing that book, for being with us, for sharing this. And is there a parting thought that you would like to leave our audience with? I would love to say that if you do this, you will have a moment where you say, this is a better life. 100% of people who have done a digital fast were glad that they did it. 100%. No one looks back and says, you know, I really wish I'd spent more time doom scrolling on Facebook. No one does. They're all glad that they did it. And I would invite you to step into it as well. Well, thank you. May God bless the ministry that you're doing. Uh, keep it up and We'll be paying attention to what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carson. I really appreciate it. You know, common sense, as I've said many times, is not common anymore. And we need all of you to participate in your sphere of influence to bring back common sense. We had a fantastic uh, conversation with uh, Pastor Darren Whitehead about what is happening in our society with something that seems so innocent, digital media. And the thing that really impressed me was hearing about the average teenager spending seven to nine hours a day engaged in these platforms, which sometimes can be useful, but most times they're not. And it's affecting their development it's also taking away from quality time that could be spent with their parents or with other individuals. What is going to be the impact in the long run of people isolating themselves and utilizing only these electronic companions? I can't imagine that it would be a good thing. So I encourage all of you to get this book and to discuss it, discuss it with your family, discuss it with your group of friends, discuss it at your church, and maybe even take the plunge and engage in a digital fast and find out that life actually can go on without all of these distractions. And in fact, it's a more abundant life. And that's what we're all looking for. And that's our program for this week. Make sure you Rate us, review us, tell people about us, and spread common sense. That's the most important thing. And remember the cornerstone principles. Faith, liberty, community, and life. We'll see you next week.